Hello, welcome to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. We are, as usual, glad and excited to, that you are with us for this first Sunday in Lent. Again, we are using our singing bowl. We use it throughout the worship service, and that just helps center as well as calms our spirits to receive inspiration from the scripture, from the songs, as well as from the word. So again, welcome to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. We continue with the ringing of our singing bowl. We continue with the call to worship. Creator and sovereign, our world and our lives are often full of threat. We return to you in this place today to be reminded that you do not abandon us to the hard realities of our lives. You are the one who saves us. You are the one who faithfully teaches us your life-giving ways. You are the one who instills courage within us to stand up from the waters of our baptism and to walk your path. Enter our hearts and lives for your powerful purposes. In the name of our baptized brother Jesus and the soaring spirit. Amen. We continue with the confession and forgiveness. We make the sign of the cross, remembering our baptismal covenants. God of faithful love and powerful purpose, there are times when we are open to your leading times when we walk the path of Jesus with courage and hope, even when doing so is fearful. At other times, we close ourselves off, hoping that you won't tear open the skies and disrupt our lives completely. Following Jesus can be pretty risky. Your compassion and faithful love claim us forever. As they claimed Jesus when he entered the Jordan, and made a bold decision to follow you. On a new and uncertain path, amen. Let us spend some time in silent reflection. God's compassion and love are forever. What God said of Jesus at his baptism, God says to us today, you are my dearly loved children, whom I love deeply. God forgives us and loves us dearly, now and forevermore. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. A Lenten litany. Almighty God, be with us as we contend with our lives and all our challenges. Thank you for listening as we bring before you the troubles that undermine us. We affirm it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Strengthen and sustain our families and our communities. Nurture the bonds between us and inspire us to live with empathy and forgiveness. Help those struggling with work or facing uncertainty in their futures, that they may find peace in your abundant love. Jesus, our Redeemer, rescue us when we stumble. Enable us to admit the temptations of the world and support us to resist turning away from your teaching. Awaken us to recognize the gifts you have given each of us and to see the role we can play in healing our creation. God, our creator, inspire us with renewed hope. Deepen our faith to hear your word and follow your way. Encourage us to bring all our hopes and desires to you in prayer. That in lifting up our souls to you, we may be shaped by your love. Let us pray the prayer of the day. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood, you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation, you protected your son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the introduction to the word. Lead us in your truth, so God. Teach us your ways and your paths. Into whatever journey lies before us. 
Lead on, Holy Spirit, lead on. Today's reading is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your, na <clears throat> for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem, O oh Israel, O oh God, out of all its troubles. Here ends the reading. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Children's Time. Gather round. It is a new season of the church here this Sunday. Does anybody know what it is? That's right. It's Lent. Now, each year during Lent, I join you for Children's Time. And I have a different theme each year. And this year, my theme is For God So Loved. Now, Lent, it's a journey toward Easter. And Easter was really an expression of God's love for us. So now during Lent, I want to explore different times during the Bible when God showed how much he loves all of us. Now, for my first one, I got to ask you a question. Do any of you like to garden? Now, I'm not very good at it myself, but my grandpa was a wonderful gardener. In fact, this was his garden. Well, it's not his whole garden. There was more on the other side of the driveway and around the house, but he just loved to be out in his garden. He planted all sorts of different things. There was corn and beans and strawberries and raspberries and peas and cucumbers and dill and the list would just go on and on. He even liked to plant flowers in his garden. Now, my mom and my brother and I used to go up a couple of times during the summer to help with the garden. You had to go up there during string bean season because you had to snip the beans, but you were also up there during strawberry season. Now, grandpa's holding a bucket of raspberries here. But one day, my mom pulled out more than seven of those buckets of strawberries in one day. That's a lot of strawberries. Grandpa might not have liked to eat everything that he grew, but he just loved that garden and being out in it. Do you know who else created a wonderful garden? Well, if you look at the book of Genesis, God created a garden. The garden was to be home to animals and birds and fish and plants of every kind. Do you know what he named that garden? That's right. He named it Eden. 
and Eden means paradise. I can just imagine that God planned each and every place that every plant and tree and vegetable would go in his garden. And it was beautiful and it was amazing. And it was meant to be a place for everyone to live. As we go through this Lenten journey, I want everyone to remember that from the very beginning of creation, God showed his love for us in the world that he created for all of us to inhabit. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you can join me next week as we look at other ways that God shows his love. Imagine a world where, wait, hold it. I need to sound like, a, like some announcer. Imagine a world where your greatest fears become reality. Welcome to Fear Factor. Each show, six contestants from around the country battle each other in three extreme stunts. These stunts are designed to challenge the contestants both physically and mentally. If the contestant is too afraid to complete a stunt, they're eliminated. If they fail a stunt, they're eliminated. But if they succeed, they will be one step closer to the grand prize. Well, anyway, that's not as well as it was done. But anyway, that's the opening of an NBC show called uh, Fear Factor. Fear Factor was an American stunt dare game show that first aired on NBC from 2001 to 2006. The show was adapted from the original Dutch version of the show, and that was called Now or Neverland. Fear Factor also ran on NBC from, uh, again, on, from 2011 to 2012, and then it went to MTV for 2017-2018. The show was supposed to highlight people uh, facing up to and facing down their greatest fears. Whenever I turned it on personally a few times, the only thing I saw was people hurling, people vomiting. I mean, they had good reason. The most crowd-pleasing, Nielsen-boosting activity seemed to be when the participants were forced to consume large quantities of such disgusting delicacies as raw fish or pig's eyeballs. Now, for those of you who eat pig's eyeballs, I'm not making a value judgment. I personally have never tasted them, but they looked like something I might not like. And you can't forget also when they were supposed to eat wriggling, squirming, definitely still alive insects. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering, maybe we tune into Fear Factor because we can't tune out the real fear factors. I mean, fear is always the lead line. I mean, it's the rapid pulse rate of all the news that's any news. In today's world, we're not afraid of what someone might force us to eat. We're afraid of what someone might make us breathe or what someone might jettison into our airspace. I mean, people are jumping. I mean, there's some st scary stuff floating around, right? I mean, we become all too familiar with mass with the distance that we keep between each other, with the lack of disinfectant wipes. I mean, we know what fear is. How many of us continually monitor, monitor the CDC or the COVID websites? I mean, we know what fear is. How many of us canceled plans and activities and get togethers in 2020 and we haven't yet rescheduled them for 2021? We know what fear is. I mean, it's wise to fear some things. I mean, if a person doesn't fear high voltage electricity, icy roads, fires, hurricanes, floods, I mean, we're fools. We need to be careful. In today's Psalm, the Psalm that you heard read, the writer boldly addresses Yahweh, asking to be taught God's, Yahweh's ways, to teach, to, to learn God way, uh, God's paths. I mean, and the, the psalmist, the writer of the psalm, is confident to petition God and really knows that they're not perfect. I mean, the, the author of the psalm even says, hey, listen, I've done the sins of my youth. I know I have done some bad things. But because they live in the fear of God, they're open to God's mercy and love. 
Only those fears, only those that fear God are open to the lesson of what God offers. Let me read to you verse 12. Who are they that fear the Lord? God will teach them the way that they should choose. Now, I want to stop right here and clear up something. I want to note what biblical fear of God is, okay? It's different than the fear factor fear, okay? In Scripture, when one talks about the fear of God, they are talking about the respect, the awe of God. In a sense, the fear of God is the convergence, the meeting point of awe and reverence and adoration and honor and worship and confidence and thankfulness in love. It, it means all of that. The fear of God means to, to trust God, to be confident in God's love and care, to be in awe of God. We live in a world of both fears, don't we? And some of the fears that we have, not the biblical kind of fears, but the fear factor fears, are real, and some are not. But if we genuinely believe in God's power and might, in the unlimited resources of God's wisdom and glory, then we have nothing to fear. Let me ask you, what do you fear well perhaps you fear not being accepted perhaps you fear being sexually assaulted violently assaulted perhaps you fear of being needy of looking foolish perhaps you fear of being in an accident perhaps your fear is being dependent upon someone to have to take care of you perhaps your fear is not having enough money perhaps your fear is no job no food no home perhaps your fear is death as disciples as participants as members of a faith community we also have fear in addition to those perhaps it's the fear of the loss of truth Perhaps it's the fear of losing control. Perhaps we have the fear of becoming obsolete in our faith community. Perhaps we have the fear of losing our history. Perhaps we have the fear of not having what it takes to go where the puck is going to be next and not where it's already been. Perhaps our fear in the church is of reflecting our neighborhoods, of meeting the needs of those around us, of being, maybe the fear is even not even being around next year. I want to share with you a moment of fear for me. When I logged on a few weeks ago and saw the results of my COVID test, and I saw the words positive. What? How? What about my kids? What about my wife? What, what am I going to do? I mean, is it, is it a false positive? I mean, I mean, we've all had those kind of fears, right? The kind of fears that put a pit in our stomach. The kind of fear that's like cold fingers gripping our throats. The fear of nearly passing out. Fear that we're going to be sick. Panic. When we've gotten test results. When we've gotten a phone call or somebody's coming into our office or knocked on our front door. Fear, panic, disbelief, anger, denial. In Michael Ondaatje's novel, Annals Ghost, two physicians are talking to one another about the massacres that have taken place in the country of Sri Lanka. And one of the doctors says to the other doctor, all my life, I have looked for the one law that covers all of human living. And I have found one word that captures it, fear. What, what can possibly usurp the stranglehold that fear has on our lives? Faith. There's a saying I ran across some years ago. I have no idea who said it. I don't even remember where I found it. I want to share it with you today. When fear knocks at the door and faith answers, no one is there. I want you to hear this again. I want you to write this down if you're like me and post it. Post it all over your place, all over your house, your work, your cubicle, your 
where you study, whatever you're doing. Hear it again. When fear knocks at the door and faith answers, no one is there. Fear kills people. Fear, faith, saves them. Fear blows up bridges. Faith builds bridges. Faith is that which saves and builds. Fear teaches thou shalt not. Faith teaches once upon a time. Fear defines itself by what we're against. Faith defines itself by what we are for. Fear holds us up in holy huddles. Faith breaks us out into mission fields. Fear turns away. Faith turns towards. Fear states, faith demonstrates. Fear counts the cost, faith holds nothing back. Henry Nouwen has taught us many, many things. But one thing that stands out in his writings and in his lectures and in his ponderings is this. When he said these words, you can choose to live in a house of fear or a house of love. You can't live in both at the same time. Where do you, where do I, choose to make our home? In a house of love or in a house of fear? What's your fear factor? Will you live, will I live in fear and hate or will I choose to live in love and trust? Now, perfect love is, of course, a state that none of us can achieve by ourselves, let's be honest. Despite our fears, our imperfections, our shortcomings, though, Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, says in Matthew 28, verse 20, with, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. As long as we make our home with Christ, we live in a house of love. I want to share with you a, a heartbreaking true story about an Amish family in Pennsylvania who had nine children. And one terrible night, early on the morning of December 4th, 2002, a fire burned their house to the ground and took the lives of five of their children. When the firefighters found the remains of the oldest girl, a 14-year-old named Katie, they found her remains as she was holding the remains of the baby of the family, little Jonathan, who was aged two. She held him in her arms as her three youngest brothers crowded around them. The place where these five huddled together in each other's arms was a place deemed so holy that the whole Amish community came in, cleared it, and a single grave was dug and five simple pine boxes were placed there. And the garden gate serves as the headstone to where these five children died together. The oldest choosing to die in the fire with her younger brothers, telling them with her presence and her hugs that they didn't need to fear. This this is what our Savior, this is what our God does and did for us. We have a God who in the midst of the storms, in the midst where fear is flying and hurling itself at us, in the midst of the tempest, God holds us. And God says, Fear not. We continue with the invitation to the offering. 
With grateful hearts, let us share a portion of the bounty of God has given to us. We do so as an act of faith and in support of God's work in this congregation and the world. Let us respond with the offertory prayer. Gracious God, you feed us with the harvest of the land and you provide for our every need. Receive our gifts of money, imagination, and labor and transform them into a feast that welcomes all. In Jesus Christ, our host and guest, amen. Let us pray, pray the prayer of the church, relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. In Jesus, your realm has come near to us in every place and time. Give your church throughout the world a spirit of humility and repentance. Teach us to trust always in the good news of your salvation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have made a covenant of mercy with every living creature. Protect all the world's creatures from destruction. Empower the work of biologists and science educators. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Even in the wilderness, you are with us. Walk alongside migrants and refugees crossing dangerous lands. Tend to those whose lives feel desolate. Give healing and strength to all who suffer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the covenant of baptism, you claimed us as beloved children. Nurture us in our baptismal identity and teach us to live in it for the sake of others. Strengthen this congregation's ministries of care and concern. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Hear now the prayers of our hearts said either silently or aloud. Let us pray. Your mercy is great. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your, your name. Your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Once again, we want to thank you for spending some time with us at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Fremont, California. We hope that you're with us every Sunday during Lent, as well as midweek. Make sure you go to our website to check out what exactly will be the Zoom link for that. And now, words for the journey. Whatever wildernesses the Spirit has brought you to, walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. We will walk in peace under the shelter of the Most High. Walk in faith, knowing Christ walks with you. Amen. We conclude with the dismissal. You're marked with the cross of Christ. We go forth to love and serve God.